Well, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Khalil Sharif. I'm the CEO of Aga Khan Foundation Canada. It is an absolute delight to welcome you all to the delegation of the Ismaili Imamat for uh, this evening's program. Uh, we are here uh, in Ottawa, uh, although we've got people participating from uh, all around the world, uh, in w as well as people here with us um, in Ottawa, uh, on the uh, traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, uh, who for millennia um, here at this point where the three rivers meet uh, were offers of hospitality to a very large catchment population of indigenous people who could come here um, in the spirit of exchange, certainly of exchange of goods and services, but also of relationships and of ideas. And so it is a great privilege and an honor for us to take inspiration from that long indigenous history of gathering uh, as we come together here and express what was the sentiment uh, that was uh, announced at the founding, the uh, opening of this building by His Highness Aga Khan and the Prime Minister some 15 years ago now, where they expressed the joint aspiration that we might use this place to bring together conversations which would lift our collective aspirations for how Canada might contribute to a more peaceful, prosperous, and pluralist world for all. And uh, that is about as good a segue as I uh, have been able to muster uh, for the uh, conversation we're about to have. Um, today we're going to be uh, launching, uh, in partnership with um, Carleton University's Norman Patterson School for uh, International Affairs and Canada's International Development Research Centre, um, the Lancet Commission Report on Peaceful Societies Through Health Equity and Gender Equality. And um, I can't tell you what a privilege it was to receive a note from uh, Professor Sami, the Director of the Norman Patterson School, um, inviting us to be a part of this launch. Because this report is not only creative uh, and insightful, uh, I'm afraid to say it's also extremely timely. Uh, this idea of what are the drivers of peace at a time when conflict seems to be uh, emerging with a ferocity uh, that I don't think many of us would have predicted uh, some years ago that we are at a moment uh, in uh, the history of the world where conflicts uh, are both festering and accumulating in an unresolved fashion, one upon the other, creating what uh, is being called in this report and I think is now um, regularly referred to as a polycrisis, where many degrees of fragility are compounding each other this report doesn't dwell on that. What this report does is try to construct a forward vision for what we might do as a society to overcome uh, this uh, situation of deep and persistent fragility. Um, and I was uh, very taken by this material, not only uh, because of its timeliness, but because it does put on um, on its head some things we often think about. We often think about um, the social determinants of health, uh, the things in society that allow people to be healthy. This kind of almost turns it around and says to us, just remember that if we invest in health, especially health equity, we might produce all kinds of important social outcomes, uh, including peace. And so uh, the... Uh, the intellectual team behind this report has done us an extraordinary service by reminding us of some fundamental principles that might underwrite uh, the kind of peaceful societies we are now all in deep, deep and dire need for. So I want to thank um, uh, the uh, team of researchers uh, that have led this. I want to thank The Lancet for bringing them together in such a powerful way. I want to thank uh, IDRC for their uh, long-standing collaboration uh, with us uh, in on a number of issues, but especially on this, uh, on this effort. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is begin today by asking um, uh, Montasser Kamal from IDRC to um, introduce the report and take us through the, uh, the main findings. Montasser, over to you. Applause, 
Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to be very brief because I know you're all here to hear. You're all here to hear about the report, not really necessarily from me. But it really gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this IDRC AKFC Carleton University jointly organized event. It, it's a testament to how collaboration can really bring people together, um, as we uh, we just heard. Um, the official launch was uh, for this report was done on September 7th, but I think it's appropriate to have. Uh, given Canada's commitment to uh, uh, peace and development, to really that this report is also shared with this audience here and with um, audience on, uh, who are joining us virtually as well. Um, and uh, as we know uh, that in context of violence, there is increased in, increase in health inequity and gender inequality. And kind of as, uh, uh, you know, uh, just to put it on the point that how timely this is, you know, sort of like you question yourself, sort of like, or we always, many people question ourselves, so like, what is the price of peace? You know, what is the cost that you can put on people's health? And the, this report really begins to answer these questions or this uh, sort of deliberations that we have, that it really all, it's not a choice of either or, it all needs to come together. And this is really what we're here to hear about uh, today, and it's really a great pleasure to have um, the authors here with us, some the, um, uh, Valerie especially with us. We know that in context of violence, there is increase in health inequity and gender inequality. The value added of this work is to understand whether enhancing enhanced gender equity and greater gender equality can put societies to pathways to peace. As I said, it's not either or. Really, everything has to go hand in hand, um, and the benefits are, are mutual uh, all around. Um, uh, IDRC supported the portion of this work through the support for the uh, metrics working group, which, uh, which uh, Valerie uh, chaired, um, and um, it's going to be a pleasure. F you'll hear from her uh, very shortly. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Valerie and the rest of the team and the authors for this report, some of which are actually, uh, some of them are here today and will be hearing uh, the findings. Uh, when uh, Professor uh, Percival approached IDRC with this, uh, with this project idea, it was kind of like a no-brainer for us, you know, bringing health and equity together and gender e equality together issues for the, uh, the greater good of peace for, for, uh, and for um, uh, development. Uh, is kind of a no-brainer because it also fits with the uh, feminist international assistance policy in terms of the of the mission and the focus on uh, on equality and fairness. Um, um, as you can see, the link between the two areas is really vital, and as you will see from the from the report. So, what I hope. Uh, just by this very short introduction that I whetted your appetite even more. Uh, you're here to hear about the, to hear the presentation, but I hope you are now even more uh, uh, poised and ready to hear the presentation. It's my pleasure now to invite the, um, our key speaker really for this, which is who's Valerie, uh, who's always been a great pleasure to have her as a colleague and as a, uh, uh, opening our eyes to new, um, to new findings on how we can do better in international development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, um, uh, Montasser, for that. Uh, before we hear from Val, I'm going to ask now uh, for uh, uh, our longtime collaborator um, from Global Affairs Canada, Jean-Bernard uh, Jean Parenteau, uh, who's been on this stage many times before, but for the first time in his current role as Director General for Health uh, at uh, Global Affairs uh, Canada. Jean-Bernard, some opening remarks from you. I'm sorry, you will have to wait a little longer before hearing from, uh, from Valerie. So let me thank you, uh, Khalil and the Aga Khan Foundation, IDRC, and the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs for inviting me to this evening. I always enjoy the events I attend here uh, in AKFC's uh, building at the delegation. Um, certainly, the Lancet Commission report is a welcome and timely contribution to an important global discussion how to ensure that no matter where you live, you can lead a healthy, peaceful, and prosperous life. As I say that, uh, Khalil is probably thinking like me about an interesting discussion we had earlier this week in Montreal. Among other subjects and case studies, we were exposed to the fact that while Canada is a leader on the global stage in funding the fight against tuberculosis, in Canada, if you live in indigenous communities of the North, your risk relative to TB increases exponentially. 
It is a stark reminder that health equity disparities lurk everywhere, not just in difficult lower and middle income countries settings. The, the report certainly reinforces and consolidates additional evidence in support of Canada's approach to this question, guided by our feminist international assistance policy. Our long-standing and continued priority to advance gender equality and women's empowerment, as well as to improve health and rights of women and girls, remains unwavering. And in the wake of COVID-19, we see opportunities to take stock of what is, what is and isn't working, challenge our assumptions, and ultimately adapt and strengthen our approach to the complex realities the world faces. A key lesson from the pandemic was the need to support more equitable and resilient health systems that reach everyone, and in particular, the most vulnerable and marginalized members of society abroad and at home. This involves refocusing investments, for example, in primary health care and ensuring that the organizations with whom we work keep equity at the center of their agendas. It also means doubling down on our efforts to improve access to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services. As the report underscores, progress made on SRHR exemplifies how advancing health equity and gender equality together can make a powerful difference. In the face of rising opposition towards SRHR and gender equality, we also need to continue investing in neglected and underfunded areas of women's and adolescent health and continue carrying our bold uh, and unapologetic uh, advocacy to advance these goals. And uh, community-led mechanisms embedded in local cultural contexts that are able to serve those most in need must be empowered to deliver on activities that advance equity, health, and ultimately more peaceful, productive societies. In particular, in particular, we know that when feminist and women's rights organizations are given support and flexibility, they can bring significant and meaningful change to their communities. We know that conflicts and crises repeatedly and disproportionately affect women, girls, and youth, and we know that displaced women and refugees are especially vulnerable. As we speak, the conflict in Gaza and Israel has led to humanitarian crisis with dire consequences on women's health. To give you an example, the International Planned Parenthood Federation estimates that 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza urgently need uh, maternal health care and cannot access health services with many experiencing miscarriages to trauma and fear. Canada is working to address acute needs in Gaza and the West Bank and, provide, and is providing $60 million in humanitarian assistance. This will help provide food, water, emergency medical assistance, protection services, and other life-saving assistance. But we cannot depend solely on humanitarian aid when a crisis hits to provide long-term stability. More than ever, we need decision makers and those at the forefront of designing development assistance interventions at all levels to internalize the recommendations of this uh, Lancet Commission uh, work. In my uh, SDGs mathematics, uh, if, if they're right, 3 plus 5 equals 16. I look forward uh, to uh, the discussion. I encourage uh, us to really think beyond the, the status quo when reflecting on how to address our collective challenges, the diversity of perspectives and experiences around the, tab around the table here in the, the room will undoubtedly help us drive this conversation uh, forward. So thanks a lot again. Merci beaucoup. Um, thank you very much, Jean-Bernard, both for those uh, for being here, for those uh, opening remarks, and for uh, the ongoing collaboration with Global Affairs Canada that makes events like this possible in the series of things we uh, do here. So thanks very much, uh, Jean-Bernard. Okay, that dispenses with all the prefatory uh, matters. We now turn ourselves uh, to um, the report itself and its key findings, and I'm delighted that Professor Val Percival, uh, who has been collaborating with us on all kinds of things, uh, is here today in this capacity uh, to talk to us about the, the Commission's report and its findings. Val, over to you.
Thank you very much for those very warm uh, introductions. I'd also like to begin with a quick uh, round of thank yous. So this report brings together the work of many people and has benefited from the support of several organizations who are listed here. Uh, two of the key contributors of the report are here with me uh, today, my colleagues Timu Toms and Dane Rollins. Their statistical analysis was really crucial for this report, and I thank them for their ongoing collaboration and efforts. Uh, Paul McIndowiri is also a contributor and sends his apologies as he's not feeling well today. I'd like to thank the Aga Khan Foundation for hosting us in this beautiful and inspiring place, and particular thanks to Khalil for his generosity in offering to make this event happen, and to Sophia and Uju for their excellent organization and convening skills. And a special thanks to IDRC, to Montasser Kamar, at Kamal and Kamar Mahmoud, who provided us with financial support that has translated into Canadian leadership on this commission. So in terms of, let me, there we go. So the report presentation will review the context of the report, uh, the report's findings, uh, my colleague Timu will undertake a discussion of the statistical findings of the report and then we'll conclude with the implications. I hope that you will appreciate that the report covers a lot of territory and we do not have a lot of time today, so I focus here today on the main messages. So let me begin with the context. As we've heard um, uh, from our earlier speakers, the earth seems on the edge. We are really living in troubled times. An increasingly dangerous and unpredictable world lies ahead of us, and one in which there's more diagnoses of problems than an identification of solutions. Communities and policymakers around the world struggle to respond to multiple and overlapping crises, ranging from the social and economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, the impacts of climate change, including food insecurity and natural disasters, and rising violence as a result of protracted and new conflicts. So complexity scientists call these overlapping and interacting challenges a polycrisis. In our interconnected world, this entanglement of multiple crises makes their resolution much more difficult. This polycrisis was not inevitable. It's a result of our collective failure to build more equitable and resilient economic, social, and political systems and the scarcity of effective leadership at the national and global levels. So we use the framing of the polycrisis within our report, but we also include a gentle critique. It's very easy for those that use the concept of the polycrisis to diagnose these problems, but we try and use this framework to point to solutions. So we argue that improvements to gender and health provide this feasible and practical pathway for communities out of harmful cycles of violence and into beneficial cycles of peace. So this Lancet Commission was launched in 2019, and it was tasked with understanding the interrelationships among the three SDGs, SDG 3, 5, and 16, related to health, gender equality, and peace. We examined a very specific question, can improved health equity and gender equality contribute to more peaceful societies, and if so, how? While the world changed significantly over the course of the Commission's work, our goals did not. We wanted to bring together uh, different disciplines to examine this question, establish an empirical foundation for the relationships among health, gender, and peace, and contribute to national and global policy development by pr providing practical and actionable guidance and recommendations to communities, to civil society groups, states, and international institutions. So like any good academic, I'll begin by defining my terms. So we define health equity as meaning that everyone, regardless of identity or socioeconomic circumstance, can, has the right to good health through universal access to health services. Gender equality ensures that everyone, regardless of gender identity, can develop human capabilities, access economic and broader public sector resources, live in safety and security, and exercise agency. So in our research, we use several methods to explore this research question. Through a literature review, we established a conceptual framework to analyze these relationships. We undertook a detailed uh, review of indicators of gender equality, health equity, and organized violence, which is available on our website. 
to establish the what, th that associations existed between health, gender, and peace. We use statistical modeling that will be outlined by my colleague Timu. And to establish how and why improvements in health equity and gender equality lead to more peaceful societies, we undertook comprehensive literature reviews, as well as uh, case studies of countries and processes. So these reviews included Afghanistan, uh, Mozambique, Kosovo, the efforts of El Salvador and Kenya uh, to address sexual and gender-based violence. We reviewed pandemic models, the gendered impact of COVID, the role of women in peace processes, gender norms and humanitarian engagement, and other uh, case studies. So like all research, we face several limitations. This is very exploratory in nature. It involves quantitative and qualitative approaches to a new research area. So these were plausibility probes. They're not causal models. We definitely need further research that charts out um, our pathways and our theory of change. We encountered some data limitations, which made intersectional approaches at the subnational level particularly difficult. Um, the, uh, I should also note positionality. Uh, the epistemology and training of the researchers um, influenced our ability to observe and interpret uh, these health, gender, and conflict processes. So now on to the substance of the report. So I'll begin with the conclusions first. So our report uh, suggests that improvements to gender equality and health equity um, have a unique and powerful ability to contribute to peace. To unleash the promise of the Commission's research, health equity and gender equality must be led by communities and tailored to their context, what we refer to as inside-out processes. Given our research, the Commission calls on the health sector to embrace, advocate for, and advance gender equal health responses. And health equity and gender equality must be central to national and global processes to promote peace and well-being. So identifying the independent role of health equity and gender equality in the dynamics of conflict and peace is challenging as health and gender outcomes are shaped by broader social and economic processes that interact with each other in feedback loops. So to enable us to analyze these complex relationships, we adopted the concept of self-reinforcing cycles. How we describe those cycles depends on our interpretation of the outcome. So the Commission describes harmful cycles as one in which health inequities, gender inequalities, and violence interact to reinforce each other. Beneficial cycles are those in which health equity, gender equality, and peace reinforce each other. And in self-reinforcing cycles, as we know from complexity theory, a significant change in the value of one of the variables can prompt the dynamics of the cycle to shift. So this enabled our, the development of our theory of change. Uh, under the right conditions, improvements in health equity and gender equality can be transformative, so they can flip the cycles, nudging communities from harmful to beneficial cycles. To relate this to the poly crisis, the, influential, the, influ the influence of this beneficial cycles can aggregate over time and cascade across political, economic, and social systems. Through our statistical analysis, which will be outlined by Timu, and our case studies, we found support for the existence of harmful cycles, as well as the existence of beneficial cycles, and most importantly, the role that improvements in health equity um, make in terms of nudging communities and societies into beneficial cycles. So while these improvements are definitely influenced by the context, we found that health and gender do exercise an independent role in leading to peace. Um, as we found support for our theory of change, we next focused on the how and the why. How and why do health equity and, and gender equality place societies on this pathway to peace? So this report argues that improvements in health and gender are catalytic. Over the long term, they transform society. They transform the way we see each other and individual agencies and individual agency and capabilities. And they challenge and shift power within society. We applied the Catherine Sickink and Thomas Rees framework uh, on the adaptation of human rights norms to domestic contexts. So we underscore that you cannot realize either health equity or gender equality principles without working towards a social consensus or a taken for granted status on these principles. Building that social consensus isn't easy. It requires tangible actions, which we call mechanisms. These mechanisms include advocacy and the institutionalization of gender equality and health equity into formal systems, 
For health equity, you need laws that recognize rights. You need to provide health services, build systems, and safeguard other determinants of health. Gender equality is institutionalized through laws and actions that ensure access to education, the ability to engage in the economy, access to technology and other forms of infrastructure, and the ability to participate in civic life and politics. Our report points out the particularly powerful role that sexual and reproductive health and rights play, that com they combine health equity and gender equality. So while these processes can be extremely contentious and challenging, through them, capabilities of individuals and groups are transformed, which catalyzes economic, social, and political change. So through heightened education, greater participation in the labor force, healthier children and adults, uh, there's less catastrophic health expenditures, um, greater uh, economic participation, and we see an economic transformation through increased human capital and inclusive economic growth. Improvements to health equity and gender equality also enable social transformations, including the ability of health and gender equality advocacy movements to build social capital and transform social norms surrounding aggression. These processes can also have important political effects, including increased quality of governance and stronger social contract within society. Gender equality is strongly linked to lower levels of corruption and health services, particularly those provided at the community level, improve trust in institutions. So here you can see the full framework, and I would emphasize that we have these important feedback roles between health equity, gender equality, and these economic, social, and political processes. Um, so in terms of lessons uh, from previous experiences building health equity and gender equality, while we advocate for health and gender to be prioritized in all policy agendas, um, we do recognize that we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. We have a promising foundation of norms, institutions, and funding mechanisms upon which policy initiatives can build. But health equity and gender equality cannot be instrumentalized for the political, security, or foreign policy objectives of external actors. We must also avoid what we call imitation projects, copying institutional structures from one setting and transplanting them to the other. Efforts to promote gender equality must avoid the superheroine fallacy, where women are promoted as leaders and agents of transformation without sufficient efforts to address the structural conditions that enable broader gender equality. And we need to understand the dynamics of conflict and ensure that engagement in health and gender does not inadvertently fuel violence. Our report also illustrates the importance of emerging opportunities, such as digital technologies, as well as the power of sharing data. So in terms of what is new, um, we fill some important knowledge gaps. Previous research established that conflict and insecurity have a devastating role on health and gender. We show that it has an independent role in contributing to peaceful societies. Uh, we provide a conceptual tool and framework for how to understand these relationships. And uh, we establish a research and policy agenda that's feasible and actionable. In the report, we have particular recommendations for broad recommendations with implementation pathways that are detailed. Um, these four recommendations are that communities and contexts should shape and drive gender equality and health equity initiatives for change from the inside out. Health responses should embrace, advance, and advocate for gender equality. Initiatives to advance health equity and gender should support openness, inclusivity, and accountability, and be data-driven. And national and global agendas for development and conflict should incorporate health equity uh, and gender equality. And now, um, oops, sorry, I forgot to change the slide. So there's our four recommendations. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Timu, for his and, um, detailed analysis of the statistical findings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to second uh, the thanks that Val has already expressed, but I also want to add uh, my thanks to Val herself because this report would certainly not exist without her. It would not have been written. And I also want to thank Dane Rollins, who's here with us, um, who was involved in all the statistical analysis that uh, I'm going to briefly summarize here. Um, and he'll, he'll talk to us in a moment as well. 
So the statistical analyses were extensive with hundreds of models that we estimated. Uh, and an in-depth discussion of these analyses would require the next hour or more. So what I will do briefly instead is to provide a comprehensive but compact overview of what uh, we've done. And I will not inflict any regression tables on you uh, at this point. Uh, for details, if you're interested, um, readers can consult the final report appendix uh, or contact us, email us, or ask us questions here. Um, The big, the big green button. Oh, yeah, sorry. Great. OK. Our central research question was, how does variation in gender equality and health uh, equity, improvements or declines, influence variation in violence and conflict? We pursued exploratory large N statistical analyses to avoid false claims about the generalizability of relationships between gender equality uh, health equity and peace, and to provide greater confidence in the external validity of the Commission's broader analyses. I want to be clear that these analyses do not examine the impacts of specific health and gender uh, interventions, but rather begin to build an evidence base for broad statistical relationships between gender health and violence outcomes, which we proxy with available data. Specifically, we aim to explore uh, if and how gender inequalities and health inequities and violence reinforce each other in harmful cycles, if and how gender equality, health equity, uh, sorry, gender equality, health equity, and peace reinforce each other in beneficial cycles, and if and how efforts to support gender equality and health equity under the right conditions have the ability to nudge communities and societies from harmful to beneficial cycles. So these proposed cycles imply feedback loops in which health, gender, and violence variables interact with each other to produce mutually reinforcing patterns which can have either harmful or beneficial outcomes in the aggregate. From the perspective of research design, our questions about cycles imply considerable uh, complexity as they examine statistical effects going um, between gender and health outcomes from gender and health outcomes to violence, and from violence to gender and health outcomes. As depicted in this diagram here, where the solid lines represent the hypothesized associations within cycles, and the dotted lines represent the hypothesis uh, about transitioning from harmful to beneficial cycles. The key point here is that to take feedback loops and endogeneity seriously, we need to investigate our three sets of variables as both dependent and independent variables, or in other words, as outcome and explanatory variables. So given uh, this complexity, we employ several approaches to the large N analyses. That is, uh, we do cross-sectional and panel regression models, and we also have some simple bivariate analysis of long-term sequences of health and gender change. It is important to note that while there are many other important factors influencing health, gender, and violence outcomes, we do not develop detailed causal models of each outcome. But we examine whether statistical associations between these outcomes are broadly consistent with the proposed harmful and beneficial cycles. I will say a bit uh, about why we take these approaches in a moment, but first I'm going to introduce the data that we use. We chose measures for the analysis guided by the indicator mapping uh, carried out by the working group that um, Val already mentioned before and that are available on the website uh, for the commission. And based on our evaluation of the quality and coverage of these data across countries and over time. For the main analyses, we chose two representative uh, and commonly accepted variables, each for the health and gender dimensions. For health, we use the life expectancy and the infant mortality rate. Uh, for gender, we use the mean years of schooling ratio of females uh, to males and the age-specific fertility rate for adolescents. We also initially did supplementary analysis with the other measures in this table, but those four are the key measures consistently examined in all analyses and which are used in the final report. To measure violence, we chose several indicators to capture different types, including state-based in internal conflict, state repression, 
and physical integrity, and the total and civilian battle-related death rates per population resulting from varying types of conflict and violence. But most of the analysis in the report focus on internal armed conflict incidents because the commission had decided early on to focus on violence committed by formally organized groups. To uh, decrease the number of combinations of variables in examining patterns of harmful and beneficial cycles and thereby simplify some analyses, we created combined and standardized health and gender indices based on the four main measures. We also developed a country classification system based on quintiles of combined health and gender measures in order to operationalize uh, interaction effects. There are two key reasons why we examine interaction effects in some of our analyses. First, simple correlations between two variables cannot distinguish between harmful and beneficial cycles. By this I mean that they cannot examine the possibility that one could occur without the other, or perhaps more importantly, that they may operate on different timelines. Second, in the simple correlational approach, it is not possible to determine whether the gender, health, and violence variables mutually reinforce each other. That, that is, whether their combinations have statistical effects uh, beyond their individual effects. So such conditional effects can be investigated with two-way or even three-way interaction terms between the health and gender violence variables in the statistical models. But this approach quickly becomes very complicated to implement and interpret. So to make the analysis more tractable, we opted for using two-way interactions between individual measures or joint classifications, which is akin to including interactions of the combined health and gender measures. And finally, we interacted the joint classifications with violence measures to examine three-way interactions. As noted, we employed both cross-sectional and panel models. The cross-sectional models allow us to examine long-term changes in the outcome variables over a 25-year period from the early 1990s to 2015, while the panel models examine short-term variation from one five-year period to the next, but over a longer time frame from the early 1970s to 2015. The two approaches have different methodological trade-offs. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail now, but if there are questions, we can, we can talk about that. Um, we believe uh, that both approaches in combination are valuable, and the panel models build on the initial findings from the cross-sectional models, and they systematically used interactions to examine uh, conditional effects. Uh, using the classifications lets us test whether particular past configurations of health and gender performance have different average effects on current health, gender, or violence outcomes. Finally, we developed a basic sequencing typology of long-term change in health and gender performance over a 45-year period and examined bivariate association with long-term outcomes. And my final slide is uh, about uh, sort of our broader findings. Oops. On harmful cycles, we find extensive support in both cross-sectional and panel models for the hypothesis that health inequity, gender inequality, and violence interact in self-reinforcing cycles with harmful effects. Um, and um, sorry, the panel analysis so the, the, the cross-sectional models, um, in the cross-sectional models, countries in the bottom two quintiles, for instance, uh, are more likely to experience future internal conflict and higher internal conflict levels before 1996 are associated with lower improvements in infant mortality and education equality. That's just one example of, of many findings we've had. On beneficial cycles, we find some support for the hypotheses that uh, health equity, gender equality, and peace interact in self-reinforcing cycles with beneficial effects. But we also come to the conclusion that it is complicated to uncover such evidence due to what we call ceiling effects, whereby at higher levels of health and gender performance, additional improvements are smaller or less likely to occur. Because we find evidence in the cross-sectional analyses that are highly suggestive of such ceiling effects, we explicitly designed some of the panel models to examine uh, such conditional effects with interaction terms. And indeed, we found very clear and strong evidence for these ceiling effects. 
Despite this complication, we still find evidence in some of the cross-sectional and panel models that higher levels of gender and health performance were positively associated with each other and associated with lower rates of internal conflict incidents. It is important to note that there was a lot of nuance in the results regarding conflict uh, or violence. In the cross-sectional models, prior conflict was often associated with improved subsequent health and gender scores, which likely reflects recovery after organized violence decreased. But in most cases, current or contemporaneous conflict and violence is associated with worse performance in improved health and gender outcomes, as expected in our theoretical framework. Finally, on the transition out of harmful cycles, we find associations that are suggestive of our theory of change. Under the right conditions, improvements in health equity can help transform self-reinforcing cycles to nudge communities from harmful to beneficial cycles. While our sequencing analysis was more limited than the cross-sectional and panel models, they show some very interesting associations that suggest our hypothesis about transition from harmful to beneficial cycles should be investigated further with new research. What we call health-led sequences are associated with both more health and gender improvements, quite unlike gender-led sequences. And yet, gender-led sequences are robustly associated with much less long-term violence, which is in line with international relations research uh, on gender and conflict. I will leave it at that um, for, for today. Anyone interested in the details of the Commission's statistic analysis can find those in the appendix of the final report or can talk to us. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm aware that we're a little bit behind, so I'm going to can my four points of extensive notes and just kind of boil this down. So Val asked me to make a comment on what this paper says about uh, economic development uh, and development economics. Uh, and I would just say a couple of quick points. One is, 20 years ago, I think we would have not been able to talk about development without talking about conflict. There was a lot of work, the very good work that was done at that time, and I think we've kind of lost that plot. So I think one thing that this paper does is remind us that we need to go back to uh, looking at the intimate connection between uh, conflict, violence, and development as a, as a large set of phenomena. So I would, I would suggest that that would be critical. In that context, I would suggest again that the notions of gender equity uh, and, and health and health equity open up the opportunity to look at these kinds of relationships in new ways. And I think that this is going to be an important lesson moving forward. I would say finally, uh, although slightly longer finally, I think we've kind of become victims of the Karenina principle, uh, whereby all good, all, all happy countries are happy for the same reason, and all unhappy countries are unhappy for very different reasons. I think that this report suggests that maybe that black box of unhappiness might be able to be prized open if we begin to look at these complex relationships again, rather than just throw our hands up and say, this is complicated. We look at this and we begin to look at opportunities to have policy uh, levers that we can maybe work with, especially I think from this report, the health and the gender equity levers that we can use to maybe begin to pry open that relationship a little bit further and rather than just surrender to the kind of easy way of saying it's such a really tough problem and, and ignore it, I think maybe we'll be able to make a bit more progress. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, I thought uh, Paul was going to speak about the implications for, for global health and I will just put up his slide. Um, one of the things that he emphasized is that this report really represents a shift um, in the processes of knowledge production, one that values uh, local knowledge production, local worldviews, um, and the report really mirrors larger debates in peace research about gendering and decolonizing disciplines that produce knowledge on peace. Um, he argues that this represents a conceptual and methodological shift in how we understand and investigate hypothesized linkages between gender equality, health, and peace, um, and that we definitely need more context-specific research. Um, I wanted to uh, just close um, with some reflections on what this might mean for Canadian foreign policy 
Years ago, I used to work in the policy machinery, and I haven't um, really engaged in those processes for a while, so my policy um, skills might be a little rusty, so forgive me. Um, but I think that the report has a lot to say about uh, Canada and Canada's foreign policy. I think Canada deserves an enormous amount of credit for its ongoing and sustained commitment to health equity, and particularly gender equality. I think our report underscores the, the support to local advocacy organizations that uh, Global Affairs Canada is spearheading is really an, uh, the right approach. I would suggest that we need to ensure that we also focus on the mechanisms of gender equality um, and maybe a little bit less on the rhetoric of Canadian values and focus on universal values. Um, and I think that the under you know some of the messages of long-term time horizons and locally led initiatives really point to the need for sustained um, sustained commitments in these areas. I'd like to just conclude with some reflections on national security approaches. Uh, and how I think that they dominate our approach to foreign policy. So after 9-11, um, national security paradigms have really permeated all approaches to foreign policy as well as fragility and violence. These approaches define the national interests in very narrow terms and adopt an us versus them approach. So the world is divided into those who are with us and share our values and those who are against us without recognition of the implicit biases that are inherent in such a division. So while we need to be clear-eyed in our approach to security threats, states clearly need to be have strong, effective, and accountable security structures. I worry that these approaches simultaneously neglect the factors that produce vicious cycles and may favor actions that deepen them. Historically, Canada's added value on the world stage has really been in the areas of human rights, protection of civilians, humanitarian responses, and human security. All of these focus on dignity and our shared humanity. Uh, this morning, I listened to Melanie Jolie, Minister Jolie's speech uh, earlier this week, where she identified two priorities, defending Canada's sovereignty and pragmatic diplomacy. Um, I fear that this may reflect uh, a narrowly defined, securitized approach towards foreign policy. At a time when the lives of civilians are under threat due to conflict and violence around the world and where that threat is increasing, forced displacement is its highest level ever, it's really puzzling to me why Canada does not re-engage in a human security uh, discourse and policy. Our report highlights a potential entry point for Canada, one that would not only improve health outcomes and gender outcomes, but that will, over time, create a stronger foundation for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Um, just so we can move on to the next segment of our event today, um, I would like to invite Montasser Kamal back to the stage as he'll be moderating the panel discussion. And I'll also use this opportunity to invite um, all of our scholars as well. So I think Montasser, you can sit right here. And then um, Valerie, uh, Oscar, Dane, you can come up to the stage and take your seat. And then I'll pass it over to you, uh, Montasser, to get over with, uh, sorry, continue with the um, Q&A. Thank you. Is this working? Okay, great. Um, okay, uh, I'm sure you've all been now intrigued and uh, uh, interested in, and sort of thought-provoking uh, from these thought-provoking presentations. Um, so the, question, the, the floor is open for questions from the floor and uh, virtually. So please uh, Raise your hand, stand up, introduce yourself, and uh, pose your question. Or if we have any questions online, please let me know. Okay, oh, here we go, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Uh, I used to work with UNICEF for many years, <laughs> so Lancet was usually a good reference for us. Uh, 
And then um, I'm just finishing uh, my second graduate's um, degree in peace studies. So I was looking at a lot of the peace indicators recently for my thesis, so this is very timely for me, uh, enlightening. So I have um, a couple of questions. Uh, one is related to um, uh, the, uh, the definition of health. Uh, was mental health included in that realm? Um, um, I understand that probably there aren't many set indicators that, like under five mortality or, or, or others that you have chosen. So mental health was one factor. Uh, in terms of gender equality, um, how about uh, indicators about men who are, uh, you know, you, re you refer to structural, um, but then also um, women, and you, you mentioned female leadership, for example. So the context for that and the, the relationship with men, that was interesting. And then in terms of the indicators, I noted that there were um, references to uh, liberal uh, indicators in terms of the uh, models. Uh, so that was interesting to me because, um, as you know, there's a lot of theories of uh, critical, uh, critical theories on uh, liberal peace. Uh, so. Um, not that I would question that, but uh, it, I was curious to understand that, uh, that framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. So rather than do a whole round, there are three questions already there, so that is great to get our uh, panelists uh, starting with that. Maybe Val, do you want to start, or uh, Dean? Does this, oh, this on automatically, wow. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much for those really great questions. Um, before I answer them, I'd just like to underscore that this was a, an attempt to establish this initial kind of conceptual framework and an empirical foundation that shows that there's these associations between improved health and, and more peaceful societies. So we didn't look at mental health. That doesn't mean that we don't think that it's important. And I think that what we hope that the report does is establish the, the, that kind of conceptual pathway that other researchers with expertise in that area could use um, in particular case studies or, 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 or cross-country analysis. So I think that um, I would welcome that kind of focus because it is important. And I think one of the things that we're seeing, um, particularly uh, in some of the reporting on, on what's happening in Gaza is just this devastating impact on mental health. Uh, in terms of gender equality and the focus on men, Again, uh, the report does uh, point to this as being a really important knowledge gap uh, and how the focus on gender equality is too often synonymous with women. And uh, we did have some uh, literature reviews. One looked at how the humanitarian community um, neglects sexual violence, sexual violence against men and boys in conflict-affected settings. We had another review in terms of um, the way that um, migration agencies kind of forget about adolescent boys in particular. So again, this is a knowledge gap that we identify and we think that is important to fill. So thank you for reinforcing that. Thanks so much. I think Dane or Timo, you want to respond to the yeah, third question? I'll respond to the, the third part of the question about the, um, I think the covariates in, the, in many of the analysis. Um, so you obviously were either able to read the fine print in the table or you read the report, the appendix, which is great. Um, we did uh, control, uh, include control variables on very basic economic and political factors in all models. Um, as I said earlier, the, this is really uh, the, the beginning of uh, building an evidence base. So we did not do detailed causal models. So we just wanted to uh, include at least some variation on the economic and political side. And for, on the political side, we, we chose an indicator of liberal democracy um, because it, does, it is associated in many studies with all kinds of aspects of health and gender and, of course, violence and peace, and that's why we included it. Thanks so much. Dane, did you want to add anything? Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments, reflections? Online, there's something? Okay, maybe we'll do one online. Um, the question that we have online, um, the person says instrumentalization of gender equality is pervasive within policy and practice. So are there any insights to share on lessons learned uh, around how to not instrumentalize it? Great question. Val? <laughs> 
So I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think that one of the reflections that we had in the report is just this, the importance of um, what we call these inside-out approaches, uh, more gentle approaches, I guess, to gender equality, where within the community and within um, the country, advocates are able to define how they see gender equality, what their priorities are, what they would like to um, move forward on. And I think that the, the challenge with instrumentalization, you know, gender equality is a really important goal that we all share, but if the objectives of gender equality are, are defined from the outside, um, it can be particularly problematic if those external actors are part of, you know, the kind of the, if, if the conflict is internationalized. So I'm thinking in particular of Afghanistan, and we had some really excellent reviews that looked at this. So I would, one of the other things that I'd like to point out is we had um, a, a review of community health workers and how one of the things that we found, and this is research that was done by the Liverpool School, but I also know that in conversations with Fawad, uh, Aga Khan uh, also uh, undertook these kinds of initiatives. And I think that community-based health workers are really critical um, instruments of promoting gender equality in very sensitive ways because they know the community really well, but even the, their participation as community health workers changes the dynamics within their household, also changes the dynamics within their community in ways that um, is, is kind of an, an easier path forward in terms of, of gender equality and builds that kind of community consensus. So that might be one uh, example that I would point to. Thanks so much, uh, Val. I think when you spoke about, earlier about kind of like the universal value, the universal values, but then you now are talking about the localization as well, and that it's really it's, there's a, a good tension there that needs to really be worked out in context. I think we had uh, someone there. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. It, uh, Please introduce yourself yeah, as well. My name is Razia, Razia Tamadi, and I'm currently doing <coughs> research for, I cannot say for Carlton University because it is a micro grant. And the objective is to develop a manual for the health providers to be aware of the traditional language that Afghan newcomers, the women are using to express their health problems. Because uh, most, I think that you, uh, maybe you know that in Afghanistan, no woman talk about her health directly. For example, he never, she never says I'm pregnant. She almost maybe said that I'm heavy. Then you understand that what's, what has happened to her. And the same thing is with men because of that. So I'm working in this. And when I was listening to this part, uh, because of the thing that I'm doing, uh, it came to my mind that so these cultural things and also the, these new cultural things that are coming to the society, and for example, by increasing the number of Afghans, the new cultures are coming. So where in this side is standing this cultural sensitivities? Whether it also has been considered, um, I, I, I believe that this study may change over the time by changing some cultural sensitivities. So where is, that, where is exactly in this study? I will be happy to understand. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you to... um, I think that's an excellent question. I would argue that, you know, why we didn't integrate cultural sensitivity as a, within the study itself, we do talk about how health systems and health services need to be much more responsive to, to their communities. And um, this is a separate piece of research that isn't reflected in the report, but I did have a student that was looking at this issue, not with, related to the Afghan community in Canada, but with other communities. And one of the things that we found in Canada is that there often is a, a link missing between health services and the broader community. And particularly if you have a new Canadians um, with 
you know, different ways of expressing health issues. There's a, there's a critical importance for health services to reach out to advocates within those communities to develop that cultural sensitivity and to understand. Uh, and so I think that you know, it reinforces the importance of the health sector being a social, you know, it's, the health system is a social system. And the degree to which you can ensure that there is receptivity or receptors in the health sector for engagement with the community and particularly um, engagement with, with people that they might not otherwise be familiar with the ways of expressing health, et cetera. I'm not sure if that's a, a good answer, but I think that it's an important issue. And, um, and I think the spirit of the report really uh, speaks to that importance of the, the linkages between uh, the health sector and the broader community. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Val. And I think maybe also that relates to your earlier comment and the findings about kind of these imitation models, you know, that how that is not the good way to go about it. <laughs> Okay, uh, do you have online anyone, any comment? Okay, so please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Belkis Visanji. I'm a professor in uh, nursing and public health at the University of Montreal. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the excellent presentation. It uh, reminds me of my uh, youth when I was studying PhD in Ann Arbor about all the mathematical models. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the presentation, and especially uh, you have mentioned a number of times the intersections with the social determinants of health. I'd like to uh, salute the fact that I just come from the University of Ottawa this afternoon, where they had uh, celebrated the memorial of Monique Bejan, who passed away not long ago, and wrote the commission, the report of the commission on uh, social determinants of health with Sir Michael Marmot. And he was online today and he spoke about uh, the issue of social determinants of health. And I, I appreciate your model about the harmful cycle, which sort of mimics to some extent what they had identified in terms of the precursors of health inequities. And um, as an example, um, Sir Michael Marmot was saying that when we look at harmful cycle, uh, one of the examples he gave was like, you know, when there is a a situation and people have to find to fight for their health or their life he he had a meeting with a lot of uh, leaders uh, of the world discussing all this and those who step on the street to cross the street when it was really harmful to some extent potentially those who were from countries where the life expectancy at birth was lowest crossed the street first and then those who were crossing the street at the end were US, Canada, and Japan. Um, you know, sort of not well built in terms of protecting themselves. My question, sorry about this long um, introduction, is how do we link your uh, promising feasible pathway to a peaceful society, which I really appreciate, to what we used to call empowerment of women, when we used to call that you know, we have to invest um, you know, the sort of example way back then of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, you know, was like a concrete economic sort of uh, pathway that we had used. What are the concrete sort of recommendations in terms of these intersections that you have found? And I, I think they're very useful. Uh, if we were to go ahead and submit our public health reports, you know, for those who are in global health in Canada, to understand how did we go from from women's equality to today looking at peace, building on health equity, gender equality, and, and, and looking at, you know, what do we give women now at this time? I'm specifically focusing on women, uh, you know, and where are we at when we look at this for the next sort of five, 10 years in terms of recommendations? Thank you. Uh, not an easy question, Val. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a great question. It's definitely not an easy one, um, and so I'll, I'll see if that I, if I can do it justice. Uh, 
The report really focuses on this interplay between the principles of gender equality and the mechanisms for gender equality. And it, there's not, you know, it builds on a lot of the earlier work that has been done in that area. So you, you mentioned Monique Bejin, but there are many other um, people within Ottawa who've done fantastic work on gender and health. And so it really is, is kind of building on, on that. Um, the mechanisms for gender equality we outline as things like access to education, access to infrastructure, access to um, resources, economic resources, which is what the Grameen Bank did. Um, and we also really focus on the importance of sexual and reproductive health and rights um, and outline how those factors um, really lead to inclusive economic growth, um, uh, improved human capital, the ability of women to participate in uh, social movements and civil society and politics, but particularly civil society. Um, there's, we, we did a, um, a case study that looked at women in peace processes. So these are the kinds of pathways that we're charting out. It's, it's not, it's not, um, it's building on that existing research uh, and, and perhaps just furthering it with a little bit um, more analysis of how women's empowerment links to these political, economic, and social processes. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. I'm just worried about, you know, being there, but not done that yet, right? I think you, the, the reaction may be, okay, we, we, we've been there, you know. Uh, yes. it's, it's nothing really, you, and you even said yourself, you know, what's new? Right? I think in, at the end of your presentation, so I'm just building on what you said about what's new to the next generation to sort of really pinpoint. We cannot say, been there, done that, because we haven't done it. <laughs> so that's sort of what I'm looking for in terms of your comments. Yeah, I think just to follow up on that, I think one of the, the things that we would emphasize that is really new in the report is this focus on the importance of of data, of understanding um, if and how those investments that we're undertaking actually are achieving results. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that been there and done that, n not really. <laughs> so there's lots more work that needs to be, to be done, but thank you for your question. Thanks very much, Val, and thank you for the question. And I think, Val, in your presentation, everyone with the team, you presented that this is a kind of a foundational piece, so to speak. Yes, it builds on previous work, but it also starts or opens doors for more work that still needs to be done and different uh, layers of analysis that still need to be done, for sure. Um, other questions? Comments? Nothing? Anyone in mind? Okay. Um, go ahead, please, here. Uh, Amber Warnett, PhD candidate at NIPSIA, um, and I also work for Elections Canada. Um, the, one of the things that you come up against, or many of us come up against, is when you deal with complex stuff, there's resistance. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, um, in terms of implementation and use of the model, do you have recommendations on, not necessarily how to break it down, or but how to implement it because because of the resistance to complexity um, uh, or ideas you have for getting past that resistance. I think there was another question here. Sorry, there, I think there was another question here. Was there? I, saw, I thought I saw a hand. Maybe Jean Bernard, go ahead. Maybe we'll just take a couple of questions this time. Uh, Val, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, just uh, just adding the, the the fact that we're so thankful to have researchers who uh, are willing to uh, take on subjects complex like that and do complex statistical analysis uh, to to figure out uh, the the world. So thanks uh, thanks a lot. Um, and Valerie, you still have good uh, policy advice reflex. So I've uh, I've noted the the elements you've uh, you've mentioned. There's probably a way to. Uh, um, to make sure that uh, pragmatic diplomacy, defending sovereignty, doesn't exclude as well um, re-engaging on, on human security. 
so uh, just wanted to uh, to say that and and you're providing a very useful framework for uh, for us at the government of Canada we we do engage we've been engaging more and more in the last few years on the issue of health equity with many organizations with a global fan, a global fund to fight um, AIDS tuberculosis and malaria with Gavi the vaccine alliance other uh, organizations and you're you're really giving us a, a solid framework to be able to to back up the the, the, the solid link between uh, gender equality, health equity, and um, and peace as well. So I just wanted to say that uh, that that, that will be a concrete use that we we will be able to to make of your research. Thanks so much, um, Val. You want to um, sure. So I think um, on the issue of resistance and back, we, you know, it's backlash, right, in terms of the report. So we talk about in the report the need to explore this in further detail. I did a little bit of this work while I was on my sabbatical um, and trying to understand the dynamics of backlash. And I think one of the things that we really need to think about in terms of backlash is understanding um, that it is the response of a system to change, right? So systems will always resist change. And uh, I think that if we can find intervention points that, um, that are circumvent the kind of that backlash, it's, it's um, you know, it's necessary to advance gender equality. So when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about appealing to universal principles. Um, and you know, and I've changed my um, my ideas on this over time. I used to talk about the importance of Canadian values and the Canadian um, and, and gender equality and the importance of um, you know strong diplomacy. And I still agree with that in many contexts, but I think that in many places, if we talk about feminist uh, approaches to gender equality, that comes with a particular baggage. And, a partic and, and, in, and I, I'm an, a strong feminist, but I don't think that everybody has to be a strong feminist, right? Like, so I, I just worry about you know, the, the use of that term, and that's something new. I used to be very strongly advocating for, for feminist approaches, and I still do, but I, I just think without the, the word feminist. Um, and I think this focus on mechanisms, you know, the importance of real concrete change and explaining why that's useful for communities. So, you know, when I was in Mozambique, there was somebody from one of the NGOs that was talking to me about um, their approaches to reproductive health. And, um, I, you know, I was kind of advocating for the, the, the shot, right? That where women get a shot and then um, they, they don't have to worry about being pregnant for the next year. And he was talking about how his preferred approach was to bring community members together and talk about why it's important for women to be able to control the number of pregnancies they have, why it's good for the community, and how it's good for community, um, for, for children not to have so many siblings so that they don't have to compete for uh, resources for education and for, um, for food, et cetera. And so I think that those, you know, we, in Canada tend, and tend to take a very individualistic approach to gender equality. And I think sometimes we have to translate those messages in ways that are more appropriate for areas where it's a more kind of social approach, right? Um, so but thank you for that very tough question, Amber. <laughs> Thanks oh, so yes. much, Val. Well, just to add to that, I think, so I one of the things that the approach and the model in the paper, in the report does, is give us an opportunity to, to ask the question of, of how countries have made that transition. Uh, and so this theory of change that Val referred to. So clearly we've observed some countries and some societies which have been able to make the transition. And yes, there was inevitably some pushback, but this was often done in a peaceful and you know uh, cooperative manner. And so I think by studying that transition path, we might be able to observe 
how to overcome uh, what might be initial resistance to these kinds of changes. So, and, and it may not even be resistance to a, poli to a specific policy. These things do evolve naturally, and so it would be a question of observing how that happens and whether there are policy levers to speed it up. Thanks so much. So another hand somewhere online, anything? No. Well, I have a couple of questions myself, so I might as well, you know. <laughs> Well, one of them actually started already speaking to uh, uh, Val, which about the community, you know, sort of, you know, obviously you tried to uh, put so much in your presentation that I'm sure many things were left out. But maybe if you could elaborate, and you give a, a great example now of how engaging the communities and, um, and how that could be um, uh, part of the dynamics of, of change or of uh, gender equality and, and health uh, equity as well. So. Do you have, um, from your findings or from the, from the preparations for the uh, commission, were there other examples or other mechanisms that you found or other um, sort of pathways um, uh, that involved communities or examples that you could share with us on sort of how important this is or in, in, in the influence or the factors that influence that? So I can um, give an example of a project that we're working on with Aga Khan, with Fawad um, as well. And it's this, um, it's called the Gen Lab. It's a, a gender laboratory where what we're doing is we are working with community stakeholders to talk about what gender norms are, um, what, um, how they impact on the health of community members, but also on their ability to access health services. And what we're trying to do is use that dialogue with those community members as a way for them to identify potential solutions that would work in their community. So we're sharing things like, in other places, there's a, there's a strong body of evidence that um, women's advocacy organizations, if a representative of a women's advocacy organization accompanies somebody to the health center, they're much better able to navigate um, you know, the health care that they receive and ensure that they're treated with dignity and that they receive the care necessary. And so that's one approach that we're suggesting that they might think of, but it's really up to the community members themselves to, to, um, to come up with those kinds of solutions. And I think that that you know, another area in the, that we talked about in the report, we had somebody from Ottawa, Jason Phillips, who's an adjunct professor at, uh, at, at NIPSIA, who looked at attacks against healthcare workers within COVID, during COVID. And one of the things that he really emphasized in, our, in the report is that um, one of the drivers, you know, we often think of attacks against healthcare as coming from external protagonists, but a lot of attacks against healthcare, and particularly healthcare workers, and particularly female healthcare workers, can come from within the community themselves. And so the importance of having that dialogue with community members and, under, and being, you know, culturally appropriate and, um, and sensitive to their needs um, would, in having some sort of dialogue between the health services and the community, I think, is really important. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. Um, other questions, comments, online, anything? Okay. We still have a couple of minutes, so I have, I have a question, but I want to open the floor for you. So please, uh, any questions? Well, I have, a, I have my follow-up question. Uh, Okay, I don't know about statistical modeling. I don't have any questions on that. I have to understand them first, you know. Uh, but actually, the, it might re relate to the statistical analysis. Uh, was there any part of the research or that you've done that relates to the generations, the different generations, to the like a life course approach to health equity um, uh, and, gener and gender equity, of course? What, uh, what did you find or what were some of the messages you can share with us. <coughs> what did the statistical analysis say? Yes. <laughs> I would just say, I think one of the things that kind of surprised me going through the analysis was the extent to which there is inertia in all of these measures. So, and again, this feeds into the idea of once you're on a good path, gender just seems to keep going in the same direction. So there's a high degree of inertia. And so one of the things that we found, for example, was uh, 
and I was surprised at was the extent to which the statistical association between something like life expectancy or, or, or infant mortality or some of the, uh, the gender measures, how much of that performance over a 25-year period or a 15-year period could be explained by the initial values. So you had a high degree of inertia in many of these kinds of, uh, of uh, systems and, and, and phenomena. So that would be one response. So I think that the intergenerational dimension of this maybe there's just a natural kind of feed through that, that, that occurs, but I, I was surprised. I mean, we were getting over 80% of the variation in performance being explained by just a couple of variables from the previous, from, from this initial stages. So it was, uh, I was surprised by that. I think what comes to mind is the digital technologies and the, in the, how that has a generational, um, there's generational differences in terms of, of how access to digital technologies can shape um, gender norms. And there was, we had a fantastic NIPSI student who did um, a statistical analysis using um, the Asia Pacific um, survey and Afghanistan and looked at how access to the mobile internet um, really helped um, uh, transform gender norms. So I think that it is an area that requires a little bit more digging, um, but I think that there's some interesting results potentially there. Thanks. Great, thank you. I'm looking at the clock. Do we still have, we have to finish now. Well, okay, well, I'm glad I put in my questions. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, really learned a lot, I learned a lot today, and I'm sure our audience is also uh, participants, so they learned a lot as well. Uh, and I think it's sort of, you whetted our appetite for more uh, digging into the, the fine prints and the appendices of the report and the report itself. Uh, it's really been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. And it's been a great pleasure for me to be here to do this uh, segment, at least, of the, uh, of the session. Uh, I leave it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for all of you. Thank you once again to all of our panelists. I think you're uh, welcome to uh, get back to your seats. And to wrap up today's session, I would like to welcome Professor Teddy um, to come in and give us a bit of closing remarks um, as to how everything that we've discussed about today and also just specifically about uh, the topic that we're focusing on here. So please just welcome Teddy. Thank you very much. I'm the last person standing between uh, the end of this event and the reception and hopefully a chance to chat more about what the report is. I guess there's a lot in this report. I, I do want to thank Val again and, and my colleagues. I uh, watched from a distance as this was happening over the last couple of years and, and it's been an interesting journey. Having worked with data for a long time, I can only imagine how painful this was <laughs> to figure out causality, which I think is going to be the next stage. And I, I think we all should look forward to maybe some more complex models of you know, uh, how to disentangle cause and effect. Uh, in fact, when I was thinking about what to say, it reminded me of an old pro project when I, about 15 years ago when I started working on fragile states, there was a project known as the Political Instability Task Force. Um, also known as the State Failure Task Force, which was backed by the CIA at the time. And one of the interesting things in that report, if you go back and look at it, is that they were able through statistical analysis to come up with three predictors of political instability. Uh, one was regime change, the other one was international trade, and the third one was actually infant mortality. Uh, but at the time, I always thought about infant mortality as an indicator of a standard of living, which is what this report was saying, but I think this is interesting because now you're looking at infant mortality on its own as a health indicator, which I think would change a little bit the, the approach of, of what the PITF at the time, as it was called, was trying to look at. Uh, so having said that, I think there's a couple of things I, I want to add. First of all, of course, thanks to Khalil and his team for hosting us in this amazing building. Uh, this has been really a, a great partnership, I think, uh, based on the uh, different funders of this research and, of course, the entire team that has worked with Val uh, over the last couple of years. 
We are obviously living in dangerous times, as Khalil has pointed out. Um, I think every day when we look at the news, it's pretty depressing sometimes. Um, maybe this is something that will improve over time, but I think there's something else as well which we should keep track of, which is Agenda 2030, which, some, which is something that many of us uh, follow and, and do in our research. We're already past the halfway mark of, of Agenda 2030, and clearly we've gone backwards in terms of a progress that was supposed to be accomplished. So we still have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, somebody reminded us at a previous meeting that was held here that the second half of the MDGs was much better than the first half. So hopefully history will repeat itself, but right now things don't look as great. And I think reports like this uh, indicate that there's actually a lot of interesting areas in which we can invest more resources uh, to see progress. One thing obviously that comes out of a report is data limitations which is something that the SDG agenda has also revealed time and time again. I know we have a lot of data, which is a bit of a paradox in a way. We have a lot of data at our disposal, and yet we always find that we ha don't have the ones that we need. So I think there's a need to collect data, better data, in order to address some of these issues. Uh, the other thing I'd like to also mention is that I think this report is really reflective of what we at the school do. Uh, NIPSIA is very much known for doing research, uh, applied research to address complex issues, and I think this is clearly the kind of research that is needed, and so I, I can't uh, thank uh, my colleagues enough for engaging with this um, very difficult, uh, uh, challenging, and yet important uh, subject. Um, so with that, I, I just want to thank everyone for, for being here, and of course, uh, once again, for, for, AKFC, uh, for AKFC's support in organizing uh, today's uh, event. So thank you very much for being here. And to formally wrap up, I would just like to take this opportunity to ask everyone to give us your feedback. We'd like to know how today's event went from your perspective, that is. So um, please, uh, maybe during the course of the mingling, feel free to bring out your phone, scan the QR code. Also, to all of our guests joining us virtually as well, the link is being shared in the chat. We just want to hear from you about how today went. Um, thank you once again, everyone, for participating, for engaging, uh, for listening in, both to everyone who came in person here in Ottawa and then to everyone who has joined us um, online as well. And with that, I'll say thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and hopefully we'll see you sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs>